All right, now you're in Proverbs chapter 1. Lots of great truths in this chapter. And what I'm going to be focusing in on first is that verse in, in verse number 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And what we preach about tonight is fearing God. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So this is like a rudimentary thing. We, are, we all ought to have a proper fear of God in our lives. This is the first step. It says it's the beginning of knowledge. If you want to have any knowledge, if you want to have any smarts at all, it's going to start with fearing God. This is a very important message. We all need to get this through our heads, that fearing God is critical, and it's going to get us on the way to understanding wisdom and understanding knowledge. It's the beginning of knowledge. Now, there's an attribute of God that we find here in Proverbs chapter 1 that many people don't hear about. Most people don't understand this. It's not being preached. It's not being taught. It just seems to be skipped over because it doesn't sound good. But this is one of the attributes of God. And people don't understand that God is not just love. Now, this morning's sermon was, sermon was great about love. It was about forgiveness, about how much God loves us and he's forgiven us. And, and, and God is love. That is true. God loves us more than we could probably even understand. God loved us, loves us tremendously. But that's not all he is. God has other attributes to him. And there is an attribute of God that we need to understand because we are supposed to fear God. We have to understand that God is an extremely powerful being. He created the heavens and the earth. And he is a God that ought to be feared, reverenced, respected, and obeyed as well as love. He, he provides the love, compassion, support. He'll be there for you, but he also needs to be respected. He also needs to be feared. Now look at what we see here, an attribute of God, an aspect of God that many people maybe haven't heard before. Look at verse 24 of Proverbs chapter 1. It says, because I have called and ye refuse. See, God's calling today. God's calling people. God wants people to get saved. God wants people to know about him. But he says, because I have called and ye refuse. A lot of people are rejecting God. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. God is here to help. He's like, I want to help you. I want to save you. I'm reaching forth my hand. Just take my hand. He says, no man regarded. Verse 25, but ye have said it not all my counsel. I tried to give you advice. I tried to counsel you, but you, made, you said it at not. You made it, made it like it was nothing. You made a joke of it. And with none of my reproof, I told you you're wrong. You did nothing to do with it. Look what happens in verse 26 because of this. Because of this attitude towards God. Because he stretched out his hand and no one regarded it. Verse 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. You say when, you, when you're in all kinds of trouble, when you're in calamity, when your fear cometh, when you all of a sudden you're desperately afraid and, and, and you know, now you want to turn to God, now you want to rely on him because you're so fearful, he says, I'm going to mock you. I'm going to laugh at you when your calamity comes. Verse 27, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Find me. This goes right in the face of so many people today that are preaching, oh, God always wants you. God's always there for you. No matter what, God is always there for you. He's always ready for you. It doesn't matter. You can never push things too far with God. That's false. The Bible says right here that there could come a time when people, when he's already called on you. He says, I have called and ye refused. You rejected me. I called unto you. I reached out my hand unto you. I tried to give you counsel. I tried to give you wisdom. I tried to give you these things and you just rejected me. Well, guess what? There's going to come a day when you get scared, when your calamity comes, when the tornado, when the destruction comes into your life, when you start going through these hard times. Now, all of a sudden, you're not going to be laughing so hard, are you? Now, all of a sudden, you're not going to be mocking God. God's going to be mocking you. He's going to laugh when your calamity comes. He says, they shall call me, but I will not answer. They're going to be calling to God, God, please help me, save me. God's going to be like, well, where were you before? When I tried calling you, when I reached out my hand to you before, before all this mess happened, you wanted nothing to do with me. Now, guess what? I'm going to laugh at you and I'm going to refuse you. This is what, this is what the Bible is saying very clearly in Proverbs chapter 1 here. 
Let's continue reading. Verse 29 it says, For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. This is the root of the problem. He says, They hated knowledge, that they didn't want the knowledge that God has provided for them in the Bible. They didn't choose the fear of the Lord. See, we all have a choice. We have free will. We can choose what we're going to listen to. We can choose what we're going to learn, what we're going to obey. If we're going to believe in God, if we're going to trust God or not, we have that choice. He says they didn't choose the fear of the Lord. And even if you're a Christian today, you need to choose the fear of the Lord. That is the only way that you're going to get knowledge. It's the only way you're going to get wisdom and understanding. That is the beginning of knowledge. You need to understand God and understand what God is completely about, that he's not just there only when you're in trouble. He's not just someone that you run to only when things start going bad in your life. Now, he is someone that you can turn to when things do go bad in your life, but he is someone that ought to be with you at all times throughout your life, not just when things go bad. You can't just ignore him. You can't just shun his counsel. You can't just say, well, I don't need any of this stuff right now. Everything's just fine. And then expect later on to just, just go running back to him. You need to choose the fear of the Lord. And we're going to get into this fear in a little bit. It says, They were none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. We need to get develop. If you don't have it already, you need to develop a proper fear of God. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, 17, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. This is something that we need to do. 1 Peter 2, 17 says we need to fear God. Now, a lot of people will say, well, we shouldn't even fear God. I know what the Bible says in Proverbs 1. I know what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 17, that it just says fear God, and that is the entire sentence, period. But they'll say we should just love him. And, and what they'll do is they'll turn to, to 1 John 4. Turn if you would to 1 John chapter 4. I want you to see this. 1 John chapter number 4. First John chapter 4, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So what they'll say is that, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't fear God because of what the Bible says here in 1 John 4, 18. It says, there is no fear in love. So they say, well, we should just love God, and since there's no fear in, in love, then we don't need to fear God. Well, there's a few problems with that. One is that the Bible tells us that we need to fear God. And two is that they don't understand. It says, perfect love casteth out fear. So yes, if you have perfect love, then there won't be any fear. If you have perfect love for God, you will be keeping and obeying all of his commandments because the Bible says also in 1 John um, chapter 4, it says that, um, that uh, what does it say? <laughs> it says that, uh, there it is. I was looking at chapter 3, and that's why I couldn't quote... Um, The Bible here is saying that, um, and this is, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So our love for God, yeah, if we, if we loved him perfectly, we would be keeping all of his commandments. And if you're keeping all of God's commandments, then there is no reason for the fear because you're doing absolutely everything right. But the, but the reason why we need to fear God is because we're not perfect. We don't obey all of his commandments. We don't have that perfect love. We need to still work at that. Yes, continue to work at it, but um, we need to have a proper fear of God. Now, 
There's a lot of reasons why we should be motivated to serve God and to keep his commandments. Oftentimes when I'm out soul winning, I'll explain to people salvation. I'll explain how it's a free gift. And people that always ask you say, oh, well, you know, if you can just, if you could just get saved just by believing, but you don't have to do any of the works, you have any good deeds, then why would you even serve God at all? That's the argument. They say, well, well if, you, if, if you're going to heaven anyways, then, then why serve God? What, what do you, why, why are you even out doing this? And that's kind of a common, a common response I get. And usually I'll explain the various reasons why we should obey God, even though salvation is a free gift. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. One reason is out of fear. And that's what we're preaching on tonight. Fear, just because we will not be sent to hell, right? I'm not talking about fear and going to hell, but just because we're not going to go to hell does not mean that God's not going to punish us in this lifetime. One motivation for serving God is fear. We ought to fear what might happen if we don't do what God has commanded us to do, if we start breaking his commandments and living against his will. The same way that I expect my children to fear me is the way that we ought to fear God, right? Now, does that mean that anytime I'm, I'm in their presence, they should always just be trembling and shaking, just fearing me completely, what I might do to them? No, it's not, it's not that type of a fear. But... They ought to have the fear of discipline that they'll receive when they're disobedient. You see, there's, there's rules that we have set up for our children. Now, they, they love being around their parents. They love spending time with us. They're happy. But they should also know that when they decide, that they know they're not supposed to do something, they go out and do it anyways. They ought to have that fear. And that fear is going to generate that respect that they need to have for their parents and understand that there's consequences for their actions. So yes, one motivation for serving God is that, hey, this is our duty. This is what we're called to do. This is something that we're supposed to do. I'm not going to ignore God's commandments. I'm not going to just, just treat them as, as though they're nothing, set them at naught, and then just go and do what I want because, hey, there's going to be a punishment. There's going to be a recompense for not doing what God asks us to do. Now, another reason that we, we obey God would be to earn rewards. Right? The Bible says that we can lay up rewards for ourselves in heaven. We can lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven. And the greatest reason to, to serve God, besides both of those, besides earning rewards, besides the fear, is probably out of love. That would be the greatest reason, the, 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 the best reason to serve Him. But it's not the only reason. There's many reasons to serve God. The Bible says that the perfect love casteth out fear. So yes, if you, are, if you have a perfect love of God, then you wouldn't need to fear Him, but... Like I said earlier, I don't think anyone has a perfect love for God other than Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why is people don't understand this. They don't understand the various reasons. Why would a person choose to obey God? Why would you even do that? If Unless it's only going to keep you from hell. That perspective is from someone who truly does not love God. If the only reason that you think that you would, that you would want to serve God is just so you don't go to hell... That means you have no love for God at all. You see, when you love God, you will keep his commandments. And the Bible is very clear about that. Think about this. I mean, Jesus Christ saved you from that punishment of hell. If you truly love what he did for you, if you're appreciative of that, if you respect the fact that he did that and that he loved you so much, then we ought to, in turn, uh, follow him and do what he wants us to do. The Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. The only reason why we love God anyways is because he did decide to love us. He did love us and say, okay, you know what? You don't deserve this, but I'm going to give you this gift anyways. Now, we have free will. You can do what you want with that. But we ought to love God enough to say, to be appreciative and thankful for the gift that he's given to us and decide to work for him and just listen to him and obey him and do what he would have us to do. Now, many churches today are getting away from preaching on the commandments of God. Not just this aspect of God, but, but getting away from teaching the commandments of God. And this is a huge mistake. Just because we're in the New Testament does not mean that none of God's laws are applicable for us today. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you would. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. You see, getting away from the law, just because you say, oh, well, we're in the New Testament, we don't need the law. That's not true. The Bible is huge, and the majority of the Bible is in the Old Testament. Don't tell me we don't need the Old Testament just because we're in the New Testament. There are specific things that have changed, and we were told about those changes 
in the New Testament. We're told about the, the diverse washings and the carnal ordinances that were changed, but everything else is still applicable for us today. The Bible says that, um, that we can get doctrine out of, out of everything that is profitable, that the, the whole Word of God is profitable for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land, whether you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. So verse two says, verse one says, these are the commandments. He's going to list off all these commandments, right? He's going to go into the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 6. He's saying, these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which God commanded to teach you. This is the commandments of God. You have to do these things. And it says in verse 2 that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep his statutes. We need to learn the fear of the God in order to keep his statutes. We have to understand, hey, there's consequences, there's punishment, there's penalty to be paid for not obeying God's commandments. We need to fear the Lord to God in order to keep his commandments and his statutes. And fearing God itself is a commandment. Look at verse 13 of Deuteronomy 6. The Bible says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. It's a commandment. It's something that you need to do. Look at down, jump down to verse 24, Deuteronomy 6. The Bible says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. See, the Bible tells us to fe that fearing the Lord is for our own good. It's for our own benefit. People look at that and they, and they don't comprehend and say, well, how is that good to fear God and be afraid of him? And again, they'll go back to, shouldn't we just love him? Well, yeah, you should love him, but in loving him, that involves keeping his commandments. And unless you have perfect love, you ought to have a proper fear of God because God does not just, um, you know, look the other way, so to speak, in general. He's, God is a God of justice. We, can under, we understand that we're going to reap the things that we sow in this lifetime and that the fear of the Lord is going to be for our own good. So let's break this down so that we, we understand what the Bible says when it says fear. Because again, people will take this word and they'll say, oh, when it says fear the God, that just means respect. That just means you show respect to God that you reverence him. Now, it's not all it means is just respect. If that's all it meant was respect, then why in the Bible would it use words like quaking or trembling? And, and, and shaking at the presence of God and say with fear and trembling. That's not just talking about a respect. Now, respect is part of that. A fear of God is going to give you respect for God. But that's not all it means. It's, it's more than that. It's not very complicated. We shouldn't have to teach you English again. If you read English, if you understand English, you should know what fear means. Fear means fear. And that's what it means in the Bible. It says um, we need to make sure that we need to have this healthy fear of God. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, if you would. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Verse number 18, the Bible says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, in the sound of a trumpet, in the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dark. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So here we see Moses at the sight of God, in the presence of God, Moses exceedingly feared and quaked. He shook. It was a scary thing to be in the presence of God. He said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, 
the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now I'll point out a few different things in the verses here. Verse 25, it says, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. He's saying, don't refuse him that speaketh, the one that, the one that speaks from heaven. He says, we can't escape from that if we refuse him. He says, whose voice then shook the earth. We need to understand the power of God. In order to have that fear of God, his voice is able to shake the earth. The Bible says in verse 28, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why do we need that godly fear? For our God is a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. He's not just a fuzzball. He's not just some, some cute, fluffy, you know, cuddly God. He's, he's love, yes, but he's also a consuming fire. God also has wrath. Guess what? In case you didn't know it, there's a place called hell where people are being burned and tortured and tormented right now beneath our feet in the center of this earth. They're in torture and pain and torment, just weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Guess how that flame was kindled? God made it. God has wrath. God has anger. God also has great love, but God has his anger. God is a consuming fire. We have to understand this. Get this through your head. God has this wrath. We need to have a proper fear of God. Don't get so puffed up. Don't get so haughty that you think, hey, things are going so well, and I'm getting away with all this sin. I'm doing it. And, and who is God? You know, he has nothing to do with me. You get that type of attitude, God is going to bring you low. God is going to abase you when you lift yourself up with pride. We need to have a healthy respect and a fear of God. Understand that he can bring you low at a moment's notice. Just like that, you could go from, from riches to rags. He can bring you down. He can make you suffer. And you need to understand that and understand how important it is to just keep his commandments and to obey God. Think about what happened with Jonah. In Jonah 1, verse 4, the Bible says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea. A tempest is a great storm. There was a great storm in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the sea. It doesn't have to be the ocean, but in the sea there was this great storm. It says, So that the ship was like to be broken. So it's so bad. There's so many waves. He's saying that the ship was about to just be broken by this great mighty storm. And then it says in verse 5, then the mariners were afraid. Now I'll tell you what, when a, a mariner is someone who spends his life, he spends his job, is on the seas, he's out in the boats, and he does this all the time. They see different storms. They go out, and, and they're, they're familiar with the water. They're familiar with this lifestyle. Now when the mariners get afraid, that's a time when you ought to get worried. When you're out there, and the captain and the crew are all getting scared by the storm that you're in, hey, that's a pretty serious storm. The Bible says in verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his gods. So now they're crying out to their own gods, their false gods, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea. So the cargo, the reason why they're even on this, this trip, they start tossing it overboard because they don't want to be weighted down. They're doing anything they possibly can to be saved from this storm, to lighten it of them. It says, But Jonah was gone down to the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Let's jump down to verse number 12 of Jonah 1. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. He's saying, look, 
this storm, this tempest, it's because of me. God is causing this. This isn't just your average storm. God is causing this storm to come because he doesn't want me to flee from his face. He told me to go do something and I'm not doing it. This is the result of a Christian. This is the result of a saved person, someone who has their faith in God, going out and going against God's will, not listening, being disobedient, not doing what God has, has told them to do. God brings this tempest, and he's stopping them, and he's putting them through all this, this hardship, this, this great storm in his life. Verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land. But they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. If you're fighting against God, you're never going to win. There's no way out of it. They said, they tried to save Jonah. They said, no, look, we're just going to try to get this boat to land. They couldn't do it. They're all under their own strength, under their own efforts. There's no way they can do it. The Bible says in verse um, 14, excuse me, wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from a raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. So first they were afraid because of the storm. Now when the storm stops, it just ceases, and everything becomes calm after they throw Jonah overboard. It says now they're exceedingly afraid because now they understand that the Lord is God and that what Jonah was saying is, is completely true. And it says they offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. <clears throat> now, I don't know about you, if, if anyone here has ever been in an extremely powerful storm, think about that. If you've ever been in something like a tornado or a hurricane or some other event that's this, this great natural disaster, this great storm that's caused it just, just out in nature where um, it can be very, uh, very scary. It can be frightening. A lot of people get scared. You know, I grew up in, in the Chicago area and there would be tornado warnings and tornado sightings and it was always real creepy. I remember, you know, the sky would turn green and, um, and, and it was just a really eerie feeling when you'd have that calm before the storm. Everything would be dead silent. The birds wouldn't be chirping. Nothing would be happening. And then that's when the, when the big storm would come, the big tornado would come. Now, I've never actually been in the middle of a tornado, but I have seen them form. And I've been around kind of close to where they've hit. And, and it can be kind of a scary event. And when you're in that environment and you got this whirlwind coming, I mean, it's such a great force that there's nothing you can do against it. I mean, you see the devastation. You see the destruction. It literally just rips up houses, splinters up to nothing. What we think is our protection, our safety net, the things that we provide to keep us safe. Hey, what God has created, what God's storm can do, it can just, just instantly just destroy it. This destruction just comes in an instant. Now imagine being in a storm like that without any shelter, without any means of believing that you have any type of protection, just being completely open and exposed. And that'll give you, that type of an experience would give you just a small taste, a small inkling of the power that God has. God is extremely powerful. Now, you don't necessarily see this on a daily basis, and I think this is part of the problem, is that people tend to forget how powerful God is. People have a tendency to, to not understand how seriously God treats sin. And when God calls you to do something, he expects you to do it. Because all you do is you hear about the positive things of, of God, the positive side, the loving God, which, yes, that's all true, but when you don't hear the other side, you're unbalanced and that you're going to start getting a false view of God. We need to understand that, as we heard from this morning, the great forgiveness that God offers and the great love that he has he also has wrath. He also has um, commanded us to fear him. I don't care how brave, how tough of a person you may think that you are. If you're confronted with the power of God, if you're confronted just by the presence of God, you would tremble exceedingly and quake and fall down on your face as if you're dead at the sight of God. Every man throughout the Bible has always done that without fail. And there's a reason why one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It will happen. Every single person will do that, no matter how proud, no matter how haughty they think they are right now, no matter how, how much they've lifted themselves up, 
it's going to happen. And because God is extremely powerful, and just being in his presence will cause you to fall down to your knees. Hebrews chapter 10, if you're not there, we're, um, where were we? Just in Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews 12. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. It's a few chapters back. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 26. The Bible says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense that the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So in verse 26, it starts off saying, If we sin willfully, we know God's commands, we know what he wants us to do, but we decide to just disobey him anyway. We sin willfully. It says that we can have a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Expect the judgment to come. Fiery indignation. God's going to be angry. God's going to have to chastise you. He's going to have to discipline you when you sin willfully. It says, you know, under Moses' law, people died without mercy under two or three witnesses. It means they were put to death when, you, when you're breaking those laws, when you do these things. He says, of how much sore punishment, that means how much worse is God going to punish you it says, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. You see, when you sin willfully, when you just turn your neck at God, when you just start doing these things and, and, and deliberately disobeying him, even though you know it's wrong, the Bible says that you're trotting underfoot the Son of God. Even though you've been sanctified, even though you've been walked, you're counting it as, as if it's nothing by adding more sin. It says you count it as an unholy thing. How much sore punishment can you expect for that? And the Bible says in verse 30, look, this is for his people. The Bible says at the end of verse 30, the Lord shall judge his people. So by his people. Now, if you're saved this morning, you are one of God's people. You're one of his sons. You're one of his children. And then in verse 31, it says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Understand this. It's fearful. We need to have the proper fear of God. There's not enough fear of God these days. Much of that is because the law is not being preached. As we saw earlier, the reason why, you know, one of the things for the, for the law being preached is to help us to fear God. We need to understand that these things are wrong. We need to understand that we're not supposed to do them. And that there are punishments associated with breaking God's law. And that will give us the proper fear of God. Deuteronomy chapter 31. We're going back to Deuteronomy. If you want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 31. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 11, the Bible reads, When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. <clears throat> the Bible's commanding here in Deuteronomy 31, it's saying you need to read this law before all Israel. Read the laws of God. By reading the laws of God, they're going to teach you that you can hear, that you can learn, and that you can fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's going to give you wisdom. It's going to give you knowledge. You're going to get that through God's law. God's law is relevant for us today. We need to hear and we need to learn to fear the Lord God. That's what the Bible is saying in verse 13. And that the children that, that haven't known anything, they haven't heard about this, they don't know this. The children need to hear this so that they can learn to fear God. We need to have that healthy fear for God to prevent us 
to help prevent us from sinning, to help us to prevent us from doing wrong. It's a good deterrent. You see, the fear of judgment is going to prevent many people from doing a lot of wicked things. Look at Deuteronomy 21, just 10 chapters earlier in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 21 and verse number 18. Deuteronomy 21, 18 says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of his city, and unto the gates of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. Yes, you heard me right. The Bible says that if there's a stubborn and rebellious son... What ought to be done with him? It says he's, a, he's stubborn, he's rebellious, he's not listening to their parents, he's not obeying them, they've chastened them, they've beat them, they've done what they can, they've done everything they could to think, how can we get our son to obey us? And he's just being stiff-necked, he's not listening to him, he's not obeying him, he's a glutton, he's lazy, he's a drunkard, he's wicked. The Bible says stone him with stones. The men of that city need to stone him with stones. That he die. It says, So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. When these sentences are carried out, I guarantee you it's not going to take very many of these instances to happen. And for these sentences to actually be carried out before people will, will get it through their heads. Hey, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I'll be afraid before I start just blowing off my mouth and just completely disrespecting and disobeying my parents. Maybe I'll think about that. Maybe I will just listen to what they have to say because I don't want to be put to death. It's a proper fear that we need to have. And unfortunately now there's a lot of laws that are in place and they're not getting the proper punishment. So nobody cares. And crime is, is abounding. There's, things are getting worse and worse. People are getting more and more wicked. And there's hardly any deterrent because people continue to do this stuff and they just get a slap on the wrist. They're not getting proper judgment. And the, and the proper judgment comes, it only becomes a force, it only becomes real when it's actually enforced. Now having the law on the books is one thing, but when it actually gets enforced, that's another. I'm sure there's plenty of laws that are on the books right now, but people... They're probably just broken all the time because nobody even realizes their law because they never get enforced. They never get carried out. Nothing ever happens. God's law is the same way. I mean, people, we know God's law. We have it right here, but nothing ever gets carried out. We're not using it. We're not, we're not um, using his laws to, to, to guide our justice system. They're just written there, and it's, and, it's, and it's of no force when it's not being carried out. Now, even when we go out soul winning, turn to Jude, turn to the book of Jude. The Bible says, you know, even when we go out soul winning, we need to have, we need to instill that proper fear with some people, the fear of hell, in order for them to see that they need a savior. See, people need to understand that they're lost, that they're, they're sinners, that they deserve to pay a punishment, that there's a judgment associated with their sin. There's a point man, unto men wants to die, but after this, the judgment. There is a judgment that's coming. Keep her from that cord. Hold her. There's a judgment that's coming, and people need to understand that. The Bible says in Jude, verse 22, And of some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So it says some people you have compassion on making a difference, and others save with fear. Now, the way you save them, it says you need to use fear in order to save them, hating even the garment spotted by, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. People need to understand, there is a fiery judgment associated with their sin. They need to be pulled out of the fire. They need fear to help get them out of the fire of hell, out from the, from the punishment, from the judgment of hell. They need to understand, hey, this is real, and be scared and say, you know what, I don't want to go to that place. I'm afraid of that place. I'm going to put my faith in God. I'm going to trust in God to save me because I don't want to go to hell. You say, oh, what a terrible motivation for people to say, hey, 
If it's going to save someone's soul, I think it's a great motivation. And Jude tells us that some people you need to save with fear. Now, this sermon is all about fearing God. But we also need to understand that this is the only fear that we need to have. This is the fear that we need to have in our life. And anything else, fear of anything else, is not of God. We are not to fear man, first of all. In 2 Timothy, verse number 1, verse number 6, the Bible says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You say, well, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean God hasn't given us a spirit of fear? I thought we were supposed to fear God. Well, in the context here, he's telling them, I, I, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the spirit, the stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. He's telling them not to fear. Look at verse number 8. It says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He's saying, God's not giving us a spirit of fear because he's talking about Timothy fearing man, fearing that the fact that Paul's in jail, and fearing that the afflictions that he might face by preaching the word, and by actually opening up his mouth with the gift that's been bestowed upon him. He's saying, don't fear those things. God hasn't given you that spirit of fear. God hasn't given you that spirit of fear. He's saying, look, you need, you, God's giving you the spirit of power. He's giving you the spirit of love. He's giving you the spirit of a sound mind. So don't worry about these things. Don't worry about the, the difficulties. And don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of those things. Preach it anyways. Don't be fearful of anything but, but God. God's the only thing that we need to be fearful of. And it's actually a sin to have fear in your life if it's not fear of God. Revelation 21.8 is a verse I like to turn to a lot when I'm out soul winning to show people all this list of sins that he'd land you in the lake of fire. And it starts off the very first words, and usually a lot of people just read over this, they don't even think anything about it, but it says, but the fearful and unbelieving. So right here in this whole list of sins, it lists murderers, sorcerers, idolaters, whoremongers, liars, all these different sins, fearful is on that list. We ought not to have any other fear in our life. You say, well, I'm afraid of snakes. Well, you shouldn't be afraid of snakes. Now, it doesn't mean you should just go up to a rattlesnake because, you know, if you say, well, I'm not afraid of them, then just be foolish and just let them bite you, you know, but you don't need to be afraid of them, okay? There's a lot of things we don't need to be afraid of in our life. We only need to be afraid of God, and we can have trust in God that he'll protect us, um, but we don't need to be putting ourselves in, in, in the way of danger uselessly, but it also doesn't mean you need to be afraid of it. Now, in um, Ezekiel chapter 2, there's another admonition. We went over this before. Um, in verse 6, it says, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Again, admonishing Ezekiel not to be afraid of what people are going to say because he's got a negative message. He has to go out and preach God's word. And God's warning him. He's saying, don't be afraid of them. Don't worry about what they're going to say. Fear them not. Be not afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house, and though they and, and thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. Now, we know that we will be persecuted if we live for God. We know it's going to come on us. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, if you would. We know that the persecution is going to come. If you're preaching righteousness, if you're living a righteous life, if you're doing what God has commanded you to do, the persecution will come. But we can't fear that. The Bible says in Matthew 10, verse 25, it says, It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his house? So saying, look, Jesus Christ is saying, look, they've called me Beelzebub. They called Jesus Christ the devil. How much more are they going to call you? You of his house, the people that are, that are children of God. How much more are they going to call, name call you and, and say bad things about you? If they're calling Jesus Christ, Beelzebub, they're calling Jesus Christ the devil. He says in verse 26, fear them not therefore. Don't worry about it. They're going to call you every name in the book. Don't worry about it. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops and don't be afraid of them. Hey, what I tell you, make it public. Publicize it abroad. 
preach it from the housetops, make it known, make sure everybody knows my word, make sure everyone knows the truth, regardless of whether it turns people away, whether people get mad at it, whether people don't, can't handle it, preach his word, don't be worried about what they're going to say to you. It says in verse 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He's saying, don't worry about those. You don't have to fear those people. The one person you do have to fear is the one that's able to cast people into hell. That's God. That is who you need to fear. That is the fear we ought to have in our life. And examine yourself. Do you treat God as just a buddy? Is he just like one of your pals? I mean, you just treat him flippantly. First of all, we ought to be showing respect unto the, the holy God and Father and the creator of heaven and earth. Every time you speak to him and, and you pray to him, you ought to be referring to God and, and giving him reverence and giving him respect. And that ought to come from a healthy fear of God. We are extremely lowly in his sight. We are, we are worms. I mean, we're, we're so low in God's eyes. Now, he has given us value. He, he loves us, yes. But we need to have that proper fear and understand our place with God. Treat him, have the healthy fear that you need to have him. Understand that you can't just go around doing what you want. God will chase him. God will chastise. God will discipline you. We need to obey God. We need to have that proper fear. I'm going to close with Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. The end of the book, the last couple verses of the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12 verse 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. This is after the, book, the whole book of Ecclesiastes. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So I said, this is the conclusion. This is, this is the conclusion of Solomon and the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, this is the whole thing. This is the whole duty of man. This is what you need to do. You need to just fear God and keep his commandments. If you do that, you'll do well. He says, because every work that you do is going to come into judgment. With every secret thing, everything that nobody even knows about, that only you and God know about, whether it be good or whether it be evil, this is going to come to judgment. So just fear God. Fear God's judgment and keep his commandments. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach tonight. I pray that you would please help us as Christians to understand our place with you and to understand you completely, dear God. We love the fact that you're merciful and that your mercies are enduring forever, dear God, and that, um, and that you have so much love. We read the verse where it says you are love, and God, we understand that, we know that, and we, and we thank you for that, and we love that about you. But help us also not to be too one-sided in, in our understanding of you. And know that there is a fear that we need to have. We need to have a trembling fear where we would quake in your presence, dear God, where we would understand your power and, 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 and your holiness, dear Lord. How holy you are and how perfect you are and, 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 and how unperfect we are and how unholy we are, dear Lord. I pray that you please just help us understand this and have the proper fear and respect that we can obey your commandments, we can listen to what you have to say for us and just do them and not get caught up in, in pride and lift ourselves up, but just to humbly and meekly come to you in fear and in trembling, dear Lord, and, and, just, um, and, and just obey what you, you would have for us to do. I pray that you please help us to have a proper, full understanding of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.